let's say if I'm asking which source you often use to get information, newspaper, radio, TV, and the survey shows 62% of the people chose internet. You might be thinking I am going to say how important the internet is or how quickly it has changed the world for a few years. But what if I tell you this survey is conducted on the website globeandmail.com? Our answer will be different because the people who did this survey on a website must be frequent users of internet. This sample is a biased sample, so we have to pay attention to how a survey is conducted. The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the ba brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills, and, and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting um, the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, the relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean um, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction with their own adults. Development and the impact of experience on development is not a one-way street. It's a back-and-forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ which has multiple sections that specialize in different um, uh, kind of processes. So we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and other parts that are involved in processing of emotion and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally uh, kind of well put together, and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress, no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference. And this illustration often used is the one of the monkeys at the typewriter. 
Okay, so we have a monkey sitting on a typewriter, and the claim here is, basically, if you leave chance and time long enough, you will get life, don't worry about it. Yes, it's strange, yes, it's wonderful, but leave enough matter, 600 million years on Earth, and you will have life. So, the monkey sitting on the typewriter, and the chances are, eventually, he produces the complete works of Shakespeare, so what's the problem? But he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So what I decided to do to run the numbers is I, instead of saying type the complete works of Shakespeare, I just ran the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing at one keystroke a second to type to be or not to be, that is the question, right? On average, how long is it going to take my monkey friend at one keystroke a second? I don't know how long you think that would be. Maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth is supposed to have emerged within? And when I ran the numbers, to be or not to be, that is the question, takes 12.6 trillion, 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 trillion years to type just that phrase. And a DNA string, that complexity emerged by chance, undirected, within 600 million years. Again, it's mathematically possible, but it's so incredibly unlikely that it would have that it tilts me in favour of the Christian story in which God creating life is simply a question of saying, let there be, and there was. The Western countries, women are becoming more and more reluctant to give birth to babies. However, the male status in society remains as strong as it ever has in recent years. The birth rates increased during 20th century, but it starts to decrease over these last two decades. In the year 2000, as an example, the birth rate remained at around 1%. There are even some negative birth rates in other countries. Birth rates dropped to its lowest point that has never been seen in the society. It also has impacts on males in the, com in the society, especially young men, and it might have some connection with unemployment rates as well.
<laughs> Let's take a look at this video of these little kids. They were offered the option of having one marshmallow immediately or two marshmallows 15 minutes later. And you've got some very cute videotape of this experiment, so let's take a look. Okay. What we found is um, a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. A researcher tells these preschoolers that she's going to leave the room. If they wait for her to come back without eating the marshmallows, they'll get two marshmallows. Mm. Or they can ring the bell and she'll come back right away. But then they only get one marshmallow. I won't ring the bell. You won't ring the bell? Okay. Looking at children over time, Dr. Michelle has found that being able to wait longer at four has some pretty powerful implications. And what are those powerful implications? Is that uh, that later in life they're more disciplined and have more self-control? Is that pretty much it? Well, they are more likely to achieve their life goals. They have better relationships. They did better on their SAT tests. I know, that's they, crazy. All because they waited 15 minutes for well, two marshmallows? I mean, I think it is crazy. I probably would have eaten all three. But <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, um, you know, actually, yes, uh, the ability to be able to to pursue your goals, in this case it was to have two marshmallows versus one, and not go on automatic and just grab the marshmallow, is a very important skill. But I think a main point in Mind in the Making is that these skills can be caught, taught if you're 14 or 40 or, or 4. It's not ever too late, and any child can learn them, any adult can teach them, and it's never too late. A language dies when the last person who speaks it dies. But you know, sometimes people say it dies when the second last person who speaks it dies, because then the last person has nobody to talk to. Well, of course, languages have come and gone throughout history as communities have come and gone. But what's happening now is something really quite extraordinary. Well, there are about 6,000 languages in the world at the moment, more or less. Nobody knows the exact number. And of these, people think that about half of them are so seriously endangered that they're likely to die out in the course of the present century. Now, the present century is 100 years. Half is 3,000 languages. So that means one language is dying out somewhere in the world, on average, every two weeks. There are all kinds of reasons why languages die. One is the physical reasons when people are affected by famine and disease and earthquake. Another is genocide when some countries deliberately try and stamp out a small language. But the main reason is globalization. That is, there are some huge languages in the world like English and Arabic and Spanish and French. And these are like steamrollers crushing the smaller languages that they find in their path. A great deal can be done to preserve an endangered language. The first thing is that the people themselves must want the language to be preserved. That's very important. The second thing is that the powers that be must want the language to be preserved. They must have a respect for the minority languages that are in their care. And the third thing that has to be there, of course, is cash. It costs quite a lot of money to preserve an endangered language. 
Think about it. You have to train the teachers, you have to write books for the children, and all that sort of thing. It doesn't cost an extraordinary amount of money, but it does cost a bit. So without money, endangered languages don't have a positive future. Cities are interesting places. Some cities are carefully planned, built for a reason, and reflect the needs of the people as it grows. Others are less conscientiously designed. Paris, for example, was originally founded in the third century as a small village, and with every passing generation it grew in size and importance. It grew from a medieval city to a modern city, but the transition was not always smooth. Emperor Napoleon III had to hire someone to oversee the rebuilding of Paris. The man he chose was Georges Eugene Haussmann. In 1853, Haussmann began the process of renovating France's capital city. His basic instructions were to bring light and air into the central districts, improve the sanitation and living areas, and make Paris a more modern, beautiful city. Not your average weekend renovation. Hausman's projects included the destruction of old medieval neighborhoods, widening of streets, building large parks and public squares, and addition of fountains and sewer lines. To add to all of this, the size of Paris had to be increased, doubled, actually, and Napoleon III issued official decrees annexing nearby suburbs to make them part of the city. One of the main priorities of this massive renovation was to connect all of the districts together. If we think of Paris like a house, each district was its own room, existing essentially independently of the other districts. Napoleon III wanted it to be easier to travel between the most important districts and to create a sense of this being one unified city, not a series of independent neighborhoods. So Haussmann created large avenues that connected the districts. More than that, he made all of the avenues look roughly the same. Buildings on a major avenue were required to be roughly the same height and style, and even had to use the same cream-colored stone for the facade. The result was to remove any local characteristics and create a uniform Paris. For the first time, the city had a specific look, a style that people began to associate not with the district, but with Paris itself.
1943, what became known as the Green Revolution began when Mexico, unable to feed its growing population, shouted for help. Within a few years, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations founded the International Rice Research Institute in Asia, and by 1962, a new strain of rice called IR8 was feeding people all over the world. IR8 was the first really big modified crop to make a real impact on world hunger. In 1962, the technology did not yet exist to directly manipulate the genes of plants, and so IR8 was created by carefully crossing existing varieties selecting the best from each generation, further modifying them, and finally finding the best. Here is the power of modified crops. IR8, with no fertilizer, straight out of the box, produced five times the yield of traditional rice varieties. In optimal conditions with nitrogen, it produced 10 times the yield of traditional varieties. By 1980, IR36 resisted pests and grew fast enough to allow two crops a year instead of just one, doubling the yield. And by 1990, using more advanced genetic manipulation techniques, IR72 was outperforming even IR36. The Green Revolution saw worldwide crop yields explode from 1960 through 2000. Seven. And so this is one picture that probably you all, uh, you all know what it is when you see it. It's a familiar uh, looking uh, image. It's uh, something that probably we all have some personal experience with, right? This is a chest x-ray uh, that would be taken in uh, your doctor's office, for example, or, uh, or a radiologist's office. And it is a, a, a good example of biomedical engineering in that it takes a physical principle, that is how do x-rays interact with the tissues of your body, and it uses that physics, that physical principle, to develop a picture of what's inside your body. So to look inside and see things that you couldn't see uh, without this uh, device. And uh, you'll recognize some of the parts of the image. You can see the rib cage here, the bones. You can see the heart uh, is this large uh, bright object down here. If you um, if you're, um, uh, have good eyesight from the distance that you're at, you can see the vessels leading out of the, out of the heart and into the lungs. And the lungs are these uh, uh, darker spaces uh, within the rib cage. And
Wilson came then from a different world, and he became the focal point of a broad mainstream American culture that thought that modern literature and wanted modern literature to be able to be read and appreciated by ordinary people. They were not modernists in an abstract sense, and certainly some of them, like T.S. Eliot and Faulkner, were too difficult for some of their writings to be read by ordinary people, but this was a world before the division between the brows or between elite or whatever had established itself as part of our consciousness. Wilson was a major player in the successful effort of his generation to establish at the heart of American life an innovative literature that would equal the great cultures of Europe. And he knew that the great cultures of Europe were there. He was not a product of a narrow American studies kind of training at all. He joined a high artistic standard with an openness to all experience and a belief that literature was as much a part <coughs> of life for everyone as conversation. He thought that Proust and Joyce and Yeats and Eliot could and should be read by ordinary Americans and help that to happen. Wilson was a very various man. Over a period of almost 50 years, he was a dedicated a literary journalist, an investigative reporter, a brilliant memoirist, and dedicated journal keeper. His biography, biographical histories to the Finland Station and Patriotic Gore are profoundly influential with Americans today. Um, I'm just going to uh, take on where Stafford left off. And the hormone I want to talk to you about is called melatonin. And it's synthesized in the pineal gland, which is a very small, it's the size of a pea in your brain. Uh, Descartes called it the seat of the soul, and it is where melatonin is made. Is this working? And it has a rhythm as well. And in a sense, it's the opposite of, of cortisol. It peaks at night. We call it the darkness hormone. In every species that we've studied, melatonin occurs at night. And it's a hormone that prepares you for the things that your species does at night. So, of course, in humans, we sleep. But animals like rodents, they're awake. So it's a hormone that is... Uh, related to darkness behavior.
we can ask two fundamental questions about animal behaviour. They're referred to as proximate and ultimate. Proximate questions are those concerned with the mechanisms that bring about behaviour. Ultimate questions are those concerned with the evolution of behaviour. We can divide the proximate and ultimate questions into two sub-questions. For proximate, how does the behaviour develop? And secondly, what causes the behaviour? For ultimate, we can ask how did the behaviour evolve? And secondly, what is the adaptive significance of the behaviour? What's its purpose? Together, these comprise what are called Tinbergen's four questions about animal behaviour. Nico Tinbergen was one of the founding fathers of the study of animal behaviour. These questions represent the different ways of studying animal behaviour. And understanding the difference between those four questions are fundamental to understanding behaviour and indeed the whole of biology. How do we study animal behaviour? Well, that depends on the type of question we're hoping to answer. Indeed, the library. We've all been to a historic library. We've all enjoyed the smell of a historic library. But what is it and what does it mean? When we've recently, when at UCL Centre for Sustainable Heritage, we've recently been asked to assess the environment at another historic library at St Paul's Cathedral, the Wren Library, an incredible place. It, and it has such an intensive smell of old books. And we were also asked, for the first time really, I was actually quite taken aback by the brief, we were asked, whatever you do, please preserve the smell. It's so important to our audience, it's so important how people perceive the, 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 the library. So that, uh, that was quite an important message uh, in our research. And indeed, smell is an important way of how we communicate with the environment. This piece of research was done by an, by an advertising company because advertisers are so interested in how we, how we interact with each other and the environment. And we see that, uh, that the majority of people use sight, obviously, to, um, to interact with the environment. But on the second place, we see that smell is also very, very important.
When you think of a leader, you may think of an individual who is, above all, bold. But a new study of fish called sticklebacks shows that shy individuals actually prefer to follow fish that are similarly timid. Researchers had trios of sticklebacks with known personalities play follow the leader. The fish were placed in a tank that had some plastic plants at one end and some food hidden at the other. In some of the groups, a bold fish and a shy fish acted as leaders, while another shy fish followed. And in other groups, it was a bold fish that did the following. The researchers recorded whether the follower sallied forth more frequently with the fish that was behaviorally similar or the one that was different. What they found is that shy fish were more likely to emerge from undercover when an equally wary fellow was already out there. Bold follower fish did not seem to care as much which leader they followed. Of course, no matter which fish a stickleback chose to stick with, the bold fish did lead more joint expeditions over the course of the experiment than their more retiring friends. That's because the bold fish initiated more trips, regardless of who might be tailing them. The findings are in the journal Biology Letters. The researchers write that when offered a choice of leaders, sticklebacks prefer to follow individuals whose personality matches their own. But bolder individuals may, nevertheless, be able to impose their leadership, even among shy followers, simply through greater effort. We may soon see if such tendencies also hold true in humans when Americans decide who they'll follow in November. Unless, of course, something fishy happens. Um, so when we talk about the polar regions, just to clarify exactly what we mean, um, we have, first of all, the Arctic at the top of the Earth and the Antarctic at the bottom. Um, so the Arctic was named um, after the Greek word for bear. Now, surprisingly, it's not after the polar bears that live in the, Antart uh, live in the Arctic, um, but it's after the little and great bear constellations that can be seen in the sky. Um, now, the Greeks also hypothesised that there would be an anti-Arctic, which is how we get the name Antarctica, um, but, of course, it wasn't discovered until much later on. Now, these regions are opposite in many ways other than just their names and their location on the globe. Um, so if we look at the Arctic, first of all, um, the Arctic is actually ocean surrounded by land. Um, so we can see here, this is the UK down here, and this is kind of Russia, and then America and Canada around here. Um, so there is a bit of land covered in ice in the, in the Arctic, which is Greenland here. Um, but mostly all this area here, surprisingly a lot of people don't realise that this isn't actually land. The North Pole isn't on land, it's just one big ocean.
Uh, this is a kind of object that you're probably all familiar with when you, when you hear the term robot. But I'm going to show you the very, very first robots. These were the very first robots. Uh, they were characters in a play in the 1920s called Rossum's Universal Robots. And they, uh, the play was written by a Czech writer called Karol Čapek. And basically, um, these robots, uh, you know, people tend to think of robots as kind of cute, cuddly toys or, you know, Hollywood depictions kind of devoid of politics. But the first robots were actually c created and imagined in a time of absolute political turmoil. You just had the First World War, um, you know, finished. That had a devastating impact uh, across Europe. And um, so pe people were kind of... And, People were kind of reflecting on what does it mean to be human, what makes us human, those kind of questions. And this kind of context is what inspired Chapek to kind of uh, write this play. And um, interestingly, these robots being human, uh, they are actually in the play assembled on a production line, a bit like uh, the Ford manufacturing uh, production line. So, even though they are human, they are assembled. And these robots are designed to labor, and that is their uh, primary purpose in society. Some adverse effects of climate changes to agricultural productions because some lands are unsuitable for growing crops. There will be millions of people facing hunger in Africa in the future. Climate change will result in less production and less food. It is difficult for developing countries to deal with climate change due to their financial status and other issues. There are many people living in hunger, especially in Africa. The climate change has devastating effects on world economy. The tropical areas on Earth are dry and hot and are originally not suitable for food production. The change of the climate leads to extreme weather conditions such as flood and hurricane, which exacerbates the food production. As a result, it leads to a continuous decline in food supply annually around 10 to 17 percent. And this trend is perceived to be continued in the future by 2070. The regions suffering the most will be some African countries. Welcome to today's lesson. We are continuing with our study of taxonomy. Taxonomy is how scientists classify organisms into different groups based on the characteristics that they share. 
So for instance, um, a good way to think about taxonomy is the U.S. Postal Service. If we want to send a letter to someone, we first start off by addressing it to the nation they're in. By default, we usually assume that's America, but it doesn't have to be. It could be England or Costa Rica or Spain. You put their nation or their kingdom. Then within that kingdom, you address it to a slightly more specific level, um, their state. So for instance, South Carolina would be the same as a phylum. Then within that state, you would address it to their city and then to their street number, um, the street they live on. Then you would address it to, say, their apartment complex. And within that complex, you'd address it by their last name to their family. And then finally, their first name to the specific person you want to get it to. And in that way, we're able to weed out all the 400 million people we don't want to send our letter to in America and pinpoint the exact person we want the letter to reach. And in the same way, scientists use a taxonomy chart to pinpoint a living creature, an organism, and how it relates to everything else in the world. Today, we're going to recount heroic tales of superhuman feats of strength, when in the face of disaster, some people are said to have summoned up incredible physical power to lift a car off of an accident victim, move giant rocks, or like Big John of Song, single-handedly hold up a collapsing beam to let the other miners escape. Are such stories true? There are many anecdotes supporting the idea, but we're going to take a fact-based look at whether or not it truly is possible for an adrenaline-charged person to temporarily gain massive strength. In proper terminology, such a temporary boost of physical power would be called hysterical strength. The stories are almost always in the form of one person lifting a car off of another. And even lifting many cars by several inches still leaves most of its weight supported by the suspension springs. But our purpose today is not to debunk any of these specific stories. The majority of them are anecdotal, and interestingly, not repeatable. In many cases, the person who summoned the super strength later tried it again only to find that they couldn't do it. Basically, what we have is a respectably large body of anecdotal evidence that suggests that in times of crisis, danger, or fear, some people have the ability to temporarily exercise superhuman strength.
All my research and that I, I conducted with my 60 plus graduate students was motivated by the need to learn so that we can teach. Of course, in, some inventions happened along the way, but I have always considered that the end result, I, I always considered these inventions to be byproducts, byproducts of the learning process. The end product for me was always better understanding, or when one really succeeded, a unifying theory that can help us in teaching the subject. I have also looked at teaching as a vehicle to try new ideas or new ways of doing things on an intelligent group of learners. That is, as a vehicle for teaching research results. In my experience, this kind of teaching is the most stimulating and motivating to students. I have also uncovered many interesting research problems in the course of teaching a subject. It is this unity of research and teaching, their close connection, and the benefits garnered by exercising their interplay that to me characterizes the successful professor. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognise that the communities have to be the authority in their language. And actually, um, a woman in the class and teaching at Sydney at the moment, a Koori woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else. She was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of our training, we do have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language. But we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. And I guess for me, the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. And that's not rocket science. It's, <laughs> it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival, we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place. So we, in, in a sense, the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. Only one country, tiny little Bhutan, uh, wedged between China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the uh, central uh, index of uh, government policy. 
and actually has had a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation, uh, and they have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on, uh, on people's happiness. But they are the only country to go that far, but you're now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses about whether uh, happiness research, uh, what effects would it have if we used it more for public policy. Uh, you're beginning to get uh, countries like Australia, France, Great Britain that are considering publishing regular statistics uh, on happiness. Uh, so it's beginning to become a, a subject of greater interest uh, for policymakers and legislators uh, in uh, different advanced countries. Our friends at the Highlands Museum and Discovery Center in Ashland, Kentucky asked a very good question. Why is it dark in space? That question is not as simple as it may sound. You might think that space appears dark at night because that is when our side of Earth faces away from the sun as our planet rotates on its axis every 24 hours. But what about all those other four away suns that appear as stars in the night sky? Or our own Milky Way galaxy contains over 200 billion stars and the entire universe probably contains over 100 billion galaxies. You might suppose that the many stars would light up the night like daytime. Until the 20th century, astronomers didn't think it was even possible to count all the stars in the universe. They thought the universe went on forever. In other words, they thought the universe was infinite. Besides being very hard to imagine, the trouble with an infinite universe is that no matter where you look in the night sky, you should see a star. Stars should overlap each other in the sky, like tree trunks in the middle of a very thick forest. But if this were the case, the sky would be blazing with light. This problem greatly troubled astronomers and became known as Olber's paradox. A paradox is a statement that seems to disagree with itself. To try to explain the paradox, some 19th century scientists thought that dust clouds between the stars must be absorbing a lot of the starlight so it wouldn't shine through to us. But later scientists realized that the dust itself would absorb so much energy from the starlight that eventually it would glow as hot and bright as the stars themselves. Astronomers now realize that the universe is not infinite. A finite universe, that is, a universe of limited size, even one with trillions and trillions of stars, just wouldn't have enough stars to light up all of space. Although the idea of a finite universe explains why Earth's sky is dark at night, other causes work to make it even darker.
Welsh is a Celtic language spoken in Wales by about 740,000 people and in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Argentina by several hundred people. There are also Welsh speakers in England, Scotland, Canada, the USA, Australia, and New Zealand. At the beginning of the 20th century, about half of the population of Wales spoke Welsh as an everyday language. Toward the end of the century, the proportion of Welsh speakers had fallen to about 20%. According to the 2001 census, 582,368 people can speak Welsh. 659,301 people can either speak, read, or write Welsh, and 797,717 people, 28% of the population, claim to have some knowledge of the language. According to a survey carried out by S4C, the Welsh language TV channel, the number of Welsh speaker in Wales is around 750,000 and about 1.5 million people can understand Welsh. In addition, there are an estimated 133,000 Welsh speakers living in England, about 50,000 of them in the Greater London. Sometimes, it's the little things that can make big things happen. Fleas and the plague, atoms and nuclear bombs, diminutive leaders in world history. Soot is one of these little things. Soot, also known as black carbon, is released when you burn dung, coal, diesel fuel, and wood. From LA to Mumbai, soot causes respiratory illnesses like lung cancer and asthma, and contributes to 1.6 million premature deaths every year, mostly among the poor. And it gets worse. Atmospheric currents carry soot thousands of miles from where it is produced to the Himalayas and the Arctic. Black carbon, being black, absorbs sunlight, so even a little soot on snow makes it melt faster. And when snow melts, global sea levels rise, threatening our fresh water, indigenous communities, and polar bears who hunt on the Arctic ice. Climate change has been a big thing for a while, and carbon dioxide has been its main cause. Scientists estimate that soot causes 25% of human-caused global warming. It's the second leading cause of Arctic warming after carbon dioxide. Let's not underestimate the impact of this tiny particle. But there's good news. Reducing black carbon may be the fastest way to slow global warming and buy time for the Arctic. Yes, even more so than changing a light bulb. And since black carbon only stays in the atmosphere for a couple of weeks, reducing it would produce results immediately. Of course, reducing soot alone won't solve global warming, but solving our soot problem now will help buy time for the Arctic and allow us to deal with the bigger problem of carbon dioxide. We have the cleaner industries, cook stoves, and diesel. Now we have to use them. In developed nations, we've significantly reduced our black carbon, but we still have much more to do. We need to tighten our standards at home and invest in cleaner technologies in developing nations. In a world going on 7 billion people, you might feel rather little yourself. But if you urge the U.S. government and the European Union to take the lead on black carbon reduction, you can make a big difference. Go to StopSoot.org and help stop these little things from causing big trouble.
The arising concern that a lot of people have about raising children bilingually, especially the preschool year, is based on the conceptualization that the human brain at birth is essentially monolingual. And the reason why I come to this occasion, because often the parents will ask me if they use two languages at home, will their child be confused because they're hearing two languages. And parents are often asked my advice about whether they should use one language on parent role, which is widely known that parents who are raising children bilingually. And the reason why most people think this is a good idea is that it will help to reduce the risks of the children being confused. Because they were able to associate each language with a separate speaker, the fear is that both parents use both languages, especially they use both languages interchangeable within the same conversation within the same sentences. The child will not be able to separate the languages. These guidelines are designed to assist clients to access the free public computers and the internet in a responsible and informed way. Although all care is taken to ensure a virus-free computer for public use, you'll see the service desk after entering the library, and you can have these services at the service desk. There are computers on each floor. You can use computers to access the internet, check emails, and library catalogs. Follow the orange signs to find printers. Follow the instructions to use the printers. Remember to bring student cards. You can charge the card to use printers.
All my research and that I, I conducted with my 60 plus graduate students was motivated by the need to learn so that we can teach. Of course, in some inventions happened along the way, but I have always considered that the end result, I, co I always considered these inventions to be byproducts, byproducts of the learning process. The end product for me was always better understanding, or when one really succeeded, a unifying theory that can help us in teaching the subject. I have also looked at teaching as a vehicle to try new ideas or new ways of doing things on an intelligent group of learners. That is, as a vehicle for teaching research results. In my experience, this kind of teaching is the most stimulating and motivating to students. I have also uncovered many interesting research problems in the course of teaching a subject. It is this unity of research and teaching, their close connection, and the benefits garnered by exercising their interplay that to me characterizes the successful professor. The fifth plan is straight salary. Straight salary sales compensation plans aren't very common, but they do have a place in some organizations. With this type of structure, you pay your salespeople a straight, albeit competitive salary, like all of your other employees, and nothing else. No bonuses, no commissions, and few, if any, sales incentives. This type of compensation plan is most often used when the industry you operate within prohibits direct sales, when salespeople work as part of small groups or teams and all contributions are equal. When your sales team is relatively small, or when your salespeople are expected to spend much of their time on other responsibilities other than selling. However, these plans don't tend to offer motivation to salespeople as there are no incentives for them to work harder. The second plan is salary plus commission. Salary plus commission sales compensation plans are possibly the most common plans used today. They're structured in a way that salespeople receive a lower base salary along with commission pay that makes up the majority of the total compensation. Organizations use salary plus commission sales compensation plans when there are opportunities to support all salespeople on this structure, and when there are proper metrics in place for tracking sales to ensure that the splits are fair and accurate. This type of plan is often the best choice as opposed to straight salary because it offers motivation to increase productivity and to achieve goals. It also offers more stability. Salespeople will still get some types of pay even if they're in training, when sales are low during certain months, or if market conditions get volatile. However, it can be more complex to administer. The third plan is commission only. Commission only sales compensation plans are exactly what they sound like you pay your salespeople for the sales they bring in and nothing else. There is no guarantee of income. These, plans, these types of plans are easier to administer than salary plus commission and provide better value for your money paid as they're based solely on sales achieved. They also tend to attract fewer candidates but do attract the most top performing and hardest working sales professionals who know they can make a good income because they know how to sell. On the other hand though, they can create aggression within your sales team and low income security, which can lead to a high turnover rate and sales rep burnout from stress.
powerful influence of Stevenson's text on the discourse of disassociation is strikingly apparent in the work of American physician and psychologist Morton Prince. Reber credits Prince with pioneering the phenomenon of popular, popularizing MPD as embodied in the spectacular case. Prince's Disassociation of a Personality, 1905, tells the story of Miss Christine Beauchamp, a pseudonym for Clara Norton Fowler, who, according to Prince, is a person in whom several personalities have become developed. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. The sound of a cracking knee isn't particularly pleasant, but it gets worse when you listen up close. It does for most people, but for me, it's, it, it actually just makes me excited. Omar Inan, an electrical engineer at Georgia Tech. I actually feel like there's some real information in them that can be exploited for the purposes of helping people with rehab. Enon's experience with cracking knees goes back to his days as an undergrad at Stanford, where he threw discus. If I had a really hard workout, then the next day, of course, I'd be sore. But I would also sometimes feel that I would feel this basically catching or popping or creaking every now and then in my knee. A few years later, he found himself building tiny microphones at a high-end audio company. So when he got to Georgia Tech and heard the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, wanted better tech for knee injuries, he thought, why not strap tiny microphones to people's knees to eavesdrop as their legs bend? What we think it is, is the cartilage and bone rubbing against each other, the surfaces inside the knee rubbing against each other during those movements. He and a team of physiologists and engineers built a prototype with stretchy athletic tape and a few tiny mics and skin sensors. And preliminary tests on athletes suggest the squishy sounds the device picks up are more erratic and more irregular in an injured knee than in a healthy one, which Enon says might allow patients and doctors to track healing after surgery. Details appear in the IEEE transactions on biomedical engineering. The primary application we're targeting at first is to give people a decision aid during rehabilitation following an acute knee injury to help them understand when they can perform particular activities and when they can move to different intensities of particular activities. A useful thing to take a crack at. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata.
Determinant human behavior is affected by internal and external factors. At the end of lecture, the speaker mentioned that psychologists are interested in explaining human behavior. Determinant is influenced by two factors, the personal factors, which are internal, and the environmental factors, which are external. The personal factors include people's belief on certain things and their individual thinking about it, while the environmental factors include temperature, air pressure, and the others thinking about them. In conclusion, one's determinant are affected by both himself and the environment. I show you with lots of people chatting around in a room is a form of description. We use different kinds of methods to describe a situation. Sometimes we have to use visual description, particularly when we do not witness the scenario. I was born during the Second World War and my hometown is X. For example, when I asked my mother about the war, I always ask her, you have mentioned this or that when you talk to me, when asked her about the shelter. I asked her what the shelter looks like and when do you go to the shelter. From her response, I could get more visual evidence as I can to write my book. Frogs are a diverse and largely carnivorous group of short-bodied, tailless amphibians composing the order Anura. The oldest fossil proto-frog appeared in the early Triassic of Madagascar, but molecular clock dating suggests their origins may extend further back to the Permian, 265 million years ago. Frogs are widely distributed, ranging from the tropics to subarctic regions, but the greatest concentration of species diversity is found in tropical rainforests. There are approximately 4,800 recorded species, accounting for over 85% of extant amphibian species. They are also one of the five most diverse vertebrate orders. Besides living in fresh water and on dry land, the adults of some species are adapting for living underground or in trees. Adult frogs generally have a carnivorous diet consisting of small invertebrates, but om omnivorous species exist in a few feet on fruit. Frogs are extremely efficient at converting what they eat into body mass. They are an important food source for predators and part of the food web dynamics of many of the world's ecosystems. The skin is semi-permeable, making them susceptible to dehydration, so they either live in moist places or have special adaptations to deal with dry habits. Frogs produce a wide range of vocalizations, particularly in their breeding, se in their breeding season, and exhibit many different kinds of complex behaviors to attract mates, to fend off predators, and to generally survive. Frog populations have declined significantly since the 1950s, 
more than one third of species are considered to be threatened with extinction and over 120 are believed to have become extinct since the 1980s. The number of malformations among frogs is on the rise and an emerging fungal disease, chytridiomycosis, has been spread around the world. Conservation biologists are working to understand the causes of these problems and to resolve them. Frogs are valued as food by humans and also have many cultural roles in literature, symbolism, and religion. Aquaculture, the farming of fish, shrimp, shellfish, and seaweeds, has been the sources of human protein for nearly 4,000 years, especially in Asia. In the last decade, however, there has been unprecedented growth in aquaculture production, more than 300% since 1984, which has increased the importance of the modern food supply. It is the world's fastest growing food production activity. And globally, more than 25% of the odd fishing and shellfish production in 1999 was attributable to aquaculture. Yes, this industry's contributions to human diet is actually greater than the numbers imply, whereas one-third of the conventional fish catch is used to make fish meal and fish oil. Virtually all farmed fish are used as human food. Today, nearly one-third of fish consumed by human is the product of aquaculture, and that percentage will only increase as aquaculture expands the world's conventional fish catch, for the oceans and lakes continues to decline because of overfishing and environmental damage. There is a lot of interesting. What forms these clouds? Why are these clouds there? Why do they sort of stick around? At the center, every cloud drop has a particle. You can't grow a cloud drop without having a particle there for the water to condense on. The key question that people not directly addressed until very recently is what actually forms these clouds? So for once, you're looking out at over the ocean. Turns out sea spray, Sea salt is a very effective nucleus for forming clouds, so it's a really good chance that those are loaded with sea salt. But if you go inland, you start to have pollution come from all kinds of places, and so different sources form clouds more effectively than others. And we're trying to unravel which sources are actually contributing to the clouds. The clouds are incredibly important players in climate change and that they reflective the white, they reflect the light back into space 
and so they're keeping things much, much cooler than they would be if they weren't there. They also play a huge role in regional weather. So in actual, we're starting to see shifts where having more pollution input into the clouds is affecting weather patterns. In particular, is actually reducing the precipitation. So we're starting to see droughts in areas with super high levels of air pollution. But Aristotle says the reason we need rhetoric is we have to be able to use it. We have to be able to use rhetoric influence, basically the rebel and the morons. We try to get them to understand truth. Truth is suggested, is different than rhetoric. Rhetoric is the dressing, is the body, right? Truth is the spirit, is the soul, is abstract. It doesn't have a body. It's not particular. If you want to get somebody to the truth, you might have to use some kind of tricks, right? Because most people are not sound and can't see the truth. That's what we think. Most people are ramble, really. Only the educated, be erudite, are actually capable of seeing the truth. If you want to get the general mass there, you may have to do fable a little bit. So Aristotle, that is rhetoric. Rhetoric is something that is used to influence people, right? And it's kind of mentally promised a logic. Uh, what we're going to discuss today is how the, the Port of London was discovered and what we discovered about it. Now, um, if you look at the historical records of Roman London, there's only about 14 actual references to London in antiquity, i.e. contemporary references, and of those, uh, only one is in the first century, uh, there are none at all in the 2nd or 3rd century. There's only one in the late 3rd century, and there's four in the 4th century. So if you're a historian trying to write a history of, of Roman London, it's very difficult. You don't really have much data. You're going to depend on the archaeological evidence, the material evidence uh, of the port and indeed the town, to have any understanding of what happened then. 
And so what we're looking at here is how did we discover about the Port of London? There is no historical documentations, no um, customs books, no tariffs, no idea of the taxes. We have to understand the port entirely from the archaeological evidence. So that's what we're going to do today. So if we move on to the next slide. I love live streaming. So <laughs> thank you very much. They call it the marshmallow test. A four to six year old child sits alone in a room at a table facing a marshmallow on a plate. The child is told, if you don't eat this treat for 15 minutes, you can have both it and a second one. Kids on average wait for five or six minutes before eating the marshmallow. The longer a child can resist the treat has been correlated with higher general competency later in life. Now a study shows that ability to resist temptation isn't strictly innate. It also highly influenced by environment. Researchers gave five-year-old used crayons and one sticker to decorate a sheet of paper. One group was promised a new set of art supplies for the project, but then never received it. But the other group did receive new crayons and better stickers. Then both groups were given the marshmallow test. The children who had been lied to waited for a mean time of three minutes before eating the marshmallow. The group that got their promised materials resisted on average of 12 minutes. Thus, the researchers note that experience factors into a child's ability to delay gratification. When previous promises have been hollow, why believe the next one?